welcome to Kincaid Church of God. We are so happy that you have chosen to be with us here today. You could have chosen to be anywhere else, in your bed, watching a game, preparing to watch a game, or in my husband's case, preparing to watch the big race. Um, but today you chose to be here with us, and what a wonderful opportunity it is for us to be able to uh, worship the Lord together. So would you stand with me this morning, and we're going to sing about choosing to worship the Lord. this morning as you can tell I just I can't even hardly talk but I know my God is the healer amen he took the stripes upon his back for my healing and for your healing this morning 
And if we'll just reach out and touch the hem of his garment, I believe without a shadow of a doubt, he's in this place and he's going to touch this morning. Hallelujah. The altar is open. If you'd like to come forward and pray, feel free.
this morning. Give him a hand and clap of praise in this place. Hallelujah for healing today, Lord. Heavenly Father, your presence is all around us this morning. I feel you in this place, Jesus. Can we sing this old chorus this morning in the presence of Jehovah? In the Friend. 
Hallelujah. Come on, church. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. And what brings the presence of God? The presence of God comes when we gather in his name and we seek him. He said, if you will draw near to me, I will draw near to you. And so no matter what we're going through, no matter how we may feel, no matter how sick we may be, no matter what kind of situations or troubles we may be having, if we will seek God, if we will yearn for him and seek after him with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength, he said, he promised that he would draw close. And in the presence of God is where we're going to find the answers to every problem that we have, every pain that we feel, every sorrow that goes through our mind, every ache in our body will be healed, will be set free, will be delivered. Peace that surpasses all un- un- unrighteousness, I mean, righteousness, joy unspeakable and full of His glory will flood our hearts and flood our minds as we draw into His presence. But we've got to seek Him with our heart. We've got to yearn for Him and desire to be in His presence today. Let us do that in Jesus' name. Let us continue an act of worship as we enter into communion. You, can, you may be seated if you'd like. If you don't have a communion cup, you can raise your hand and the ushers will bring you one. Has anyone not been served communion? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, part B, verse 24, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When we see that, Jesus is basically explaining to us what he did during the incarnation, what he did with his life. In the image that he he gives us, he says he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, And then he gave it to them. And since the bread is all about the body of Christ, Jesus, in this one act, summarized everything that he was about to do on the cross. All that he had come from heaven to do for us. He took bread. He took the body of a man. And in that body, he lived a perfect, sinless life. It says he gave thanks. He gave thanks to God and he laid down that life that he had taken. He says he broke the bread. He broke his body on the cross so in the end he could finally give himself to us. You and I have the greatest gift we could ever dream of in Christ. The whole thing that God did for us in giving us his son. And when we do this, we cannot do this out of habit. We cannot do this out of just some kind of blind ritual. We need to remember what he done for us that he took bread, his body, he lived a perfect life for you and me, he allowed that body of his to be broken so brutally, and then he gave it that life that he gained to each one of us. As we begin to take the elements, as we think about the elements and we pray for the elements, let us remember what Jesus did for us. And I want to take just a few moments to reflect not necessarily reflect, am I worthy to partake of this cup, but to think about what he did. Think about our motivation in wanting to take this cup. Why do we want to do this? Why do we do this on the first Sunday of every month? Is it just a habit? Or is it so that we, as he asks us to do, remember him? And what do we remember? Do we remember his perfect life? Do we remember his, the betrayal Do we remember the accusations and the mockery, the spit and the pulling of the beard? The stripes that were ripped down his back by the cat of nine tails? Do we remember the thorns? Do we remember the weight of the crossbeam as he carried it to Golgotha? Do we remember the nails? The gasping for air as he'd have to push up on the nails in his feet in order to breathe? Do we remember the spear that was thrust in his side? Do we remember the tomb? And do we remember that the stone was rolled away and he is no longer in that tomb, but he came back to life? He ascended into the Father and now makes intercession for you and me. And one day, very, very, very soon, he will return and bring us to himself. This is what we should remember. So let's just take a few seconds to think, meditate on what Jesus did for us.
here, Lord Jesus. I thank you so much that you took human form. You became incarnate. You became like one of us. You lived on this earth and you lived in poverty and in suffering and with lack. But you lived a perfect, sinless life. The life that none of us could ever live. You allowed your body to be taken. You gave your life. You allowed it to be broken. You allowed the skin of your back to be stripped from you for our healing. You allowed nails to be placed in your hands. The hands in which had just healed the blind. They had just raised little girls from the dead. Not the hands and thief the hands of a thief, but the hands of Almighty God that placed the stars in the sky. They placed nails into your feet, the feet that walks on streets of gold, the feet in which angels fall down and worship, the feet in which the woman washed with her tears and dried with her hair. The body and the blood we thank you for. And as we take this symbol of what you've done for us, let us remember, not just in this moment, But throughout this day, throughout this week, throughout all eternity, what you did on our behalf. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may partake of the elements. Lord Jesus, we thank you for everything you've done for us. May this never be a habit. May it never be some just some sort of religious ritual. May it be something that in every time we do it, from the time we do it to the next time we do it, we remember. No matter what we're going through, no matter what we're doing, what you endured and went through for us. And that you will never leave us and never forsake us. That you truly are Emmanuel, God with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue worship as we enter into the offering. The ushers can come. In light of what we just celebrated in Jesus' giving of himself to us, let us now return back a portion of what he has asked for us. Out of thanksgiving, out of appreciation, out of love for all he's done. I remind you that at Kincaid Church of God, we have three ways to give. You can do that uh, through by sending it uh, through the mail. You can do it online. You can also do it through texting. There's also a box in the foyer that you can place your tithes and offerings in. Let us pray for the Lord, over the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much in all that you have blessed us with. Whether we have much or we, whether we have little, that is your gift to us. And I pray that we'll be faithful to you in returning back what belongs to you. Because all that we are, all that we have, is because of your grace and because of your love. We pray that you will bless the gift and the giver and use this for your purpose, for your glory, and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. So much for your giving and welcome to back to church uh, to me the days in between services are far far too too long uh, maybe not for you but for me I do want to thank everyone who participated in the trunk or treat uh, it was uh, <laughs> I froze uh, <laughs> I also learned that I never ever ever want to grow a beard uh, I think I'm still spitting out the hair of Moses's beard uh, But, you know, these kind of things only work when we do them together and that we do them uh, with the right purpose and the right heart, and I want to thank you for that. I also want to remind you that (laughs) peanut brittle starts this week. Uh, No, that's not a plague. That's something actually that we make, peanut brittle. 
No, it's something that I want it to be, I want this to be a really fun time for us. This will be my first time ever making peanut, peanut brittle. I mean, my kids ate peanut brittle for the first time last year. So it's not something that we've seen done. And let me just say this. It's not about how much we make. It's not even about how good it tastes. And not even how much money we make. It's about coming together, doing something, and let's do it for the glory of God. And, you know, uh, receive the blessing that it is. And so I do encourage you, if you haven't signed up, to sign up. I know it's uh, not something that you can think of that's going to be a whole lot of fun. But when we come together, I always find that we just have fun. And so let's, let's, let's make it that and let's do it together. I also want to remind you, to, this Sunday is the last Sunday to sign up for the Thanksgiving dinner. We really, really, really need you to sign up so we know how many people. We have to tell the caterer this week how many people we're going to have. So please don't forget to do that. I would hate to have to call you and tell, ask you, are you eating Thanksgiving with us? Are you going to go to hell? Okay? No. That's a joke. All right? That's a joke. That's a joke. Lighten up. Uh, just sign up. Have a Thanksgiving, a Thanksgiving dinner together. Now, I do want to say this. We are not charging. Even though we're catering the mint dinner, we're not charging. We are going to have a donation jar because it is going to be a little expensive. And so if you can contribute, contribute. If you can't, that's fine. Do not feel guilty. Do not feel anything. We want you to have dinner with us, a Thanksgiving dinner as our church family. So, But we just need to know how many. And I need that list to be certain size because I want them to also serve us uh, so that people in the church don't have to work. And we are going to ask the ladies or men, or children, to make desserts because their desserts were too expensive, and I know our desserts would, have, would be much better anyway. So please don't forget to do that. All right, for Children's Church, wow, our kids are getting big. <laughs> Shows you what happens when you eat out Halloween candy all week long. Yeah. You can join them in the back. Let's pray over our kids. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for our children. We thank you for the life that they represent, the life that you gave. We thank you for those who volunteer and are dedicated to, to teaching them and training them about you. And I pray in their time together, you will just pour out your blessings on both the teacher and the student and allow them to mutually benefit and be encouraged in their faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we're going to continue the series on learning to listen, and today we're going to talk about seeking confirmation. Now in the first three sermons, we talked about uh, why we should hear from God, and then last week we started getting into how we can hear from God, and we talked about four practical ways to hear God's voice, that we can set an appointment, and I would ask you to raise your hands if you actually did that, but I won't do that. Uh, I don't want the tempt people to lie in church. Uh, it also talked about being still and worshiping God, praising, I mean praying and reading, the, you know, and reading the scripture and listening and writing down what we feel like God is saying. Now I do think that last week's sermon was probably one of the most important in the series because if we don't desire to hear God's voice, then if we don't desire it enough to actually set time aside to do it, then how in the world do we think that we're ever going to grow in our faith? How in the world do we think we're ever going to have the type of life that Jesus promised to give us, that abundant life in Christ, if we're not even willing to desire to hear his word? And one of the things that worries me more and more as the longer that I'm, I, I'm here is that how many people seem to not desire the voice of God? They do not desire to seem to get closer to God. They don't desire to seem to grow in him at all. And we have to be a people... Because either we're seeking him or we're seeking something else. Either we're seeking to know God more or we're moving away from him. And those are the two choices. Either we're going to move closer to God or we're going to move away from him. And that's really what we, we have to face. And if, we don't, if we're not even willing to set time aside, we're never going to come to the level that God wants us to reach in our relationship with him. Now, it is best if we can, do, if we can spend time with God every, every, every day. But at worst, it needs to be at least three to four times to five times a week that we're spending in God's presence. I mean, times will happen in which we can't spend with God. Things come up in life, but he needs to be a priority. 
And at the end of every sermon, I always ask a question about what is God saying to you through the sermon. But I actually want you to ask that question to God now. What is God trying to say to your li- in your life as an individual and also as a member of this church right now? Because during the next 30 to 45 minutes, God is going to speak to you. The question is, do you even desire to hear his voice? Will you hear his voice and will you acknowledge it and then will you obey? A frequent question I get asked though when I'm talking about hearing the voice of God, people will ask me this question, how do I know it's God? How do I know that it's not just something I'm making up in my mind when I feel something, you know, when I feel that God is speaking to me or I think he's speaking to me through his word? How do I know it's actually from God? How do I actually know it's not just something of my imagination? Now, I know there are people who think that every thought they ever have comes from God. And I hate to tell those people, but that's just simply not the case. Because our, our minds are a place of spiritual warfare. It is a place in which not only is God trying to speak to us, but the world and the devil is also trying to speak to us and convince us to go in other ways. But how do we know it's from Him? And I want to encourage you that it's okay if you feel like God is speaking something in your life, something, something about your future, something about a ministry, something about in this church or in your family or in your community, whatever it may be, that it's okay to ask God, can you confirm that? Will you confirm to me that it's actually you speaking to me? Now, I know there are many people in the church that have portrayed that that's almost a sinful thing to do. That you should never question God. When you hear him, you simply obey. But we can see in scripture over and over and over again how people wanted to make sure that it was God speaking to him. And it is okay if we do that as well. And I personally believe that God always confirms his word. Always confirms what he is speaking to us. If he is asking us to do something and he tells us to do something, He will confirm that he wants us to do it. Now, we may or may not listen. And you say, well, you know, I'm going through a time in my life in which I haven't heard from God. Well, I can promise you, if you're not hearing from God, you did not do the last thing that he told you to do. Because it's not like you, you go up to your kids and you say, you know, I want you to clean your room. And then they just ignore you, and then you say, okay, well, have a nice dinner, okay? And and then I want you to watch some TV afterwards. No, you say, I want you to clean your room. I want you to clean your room. And until they clean your room, their room, if you're a good parent, they're not going to do anything else because you're the parent and they're the child. Clean your room. You think God is going to ask us to do something and then we ignore him completely and then just, okay, just forget about what I told you before, now go do this. No. But he will always confirm it. And often we, God is telling us the same thing over and over and over and over again. This is the fifth sermon in a series called Listening, Learning to Listen to God. You think God might be trying to tell you something by leading me to preach this series? That he wants you to hear him. And he wants to confirm. Maybe God is asking you to change something in your life. Maybe to give something up or to do something that you're not doing. But he will always confirm it. In Mark chapter 16 verse 20... Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. So signs and wonders can be actually a confirmation of the word of God already given. There is an Old Testament principle that Jesus confirms in the New Testament that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Every word. Matthew chapter 18, verse 16. But if they will not listen... Take one or two others along, that so every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So God may be trying to tell you to do things. He may be using other sources to try to tell you to do things. He may be using his word. He may be using the music that Brent chooses. He may be using many different things to try to tell you the same thing. But often we won't listen. Paul also refers to this two or three witnesses thing in 2 Corinthians 13, 1. This will be my third visit to you. Now, you may or may not know this. We have 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, but there's actually a third letter that was never discovered, never found, that comes before 1 Corinthians. And we know that from the biblical text itself. 
But in, 13, in 2 Corinthians 13, 1, it says, This will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And so there's times in which we, we, we think we're hearing from God. There's times in which we think he's speaking to us, maybe through his word, maybe through a sermon, maybe through a friend, maybe through a song, maybe through nature, whatever he chooses. We can't put God in a box and say, you can only speak to me in this way. But we need confirmation. Because maybe what we think God is trying to tell us to do is big. Or maybe it's something we don't want to do. Or maybe it's something we're afraid of. Or maybe it's something that requires us to change. And we need confirmation. Perhaps God might be telling you, you feel like God is telling you that you need to go from one job to another job. And you need confirmation. Maybe you're, you, know, you have a big decision to make or something to buy. And you need God's guidance. You need him to confirm the guidance that you feel like he's given you. And probably the most famous story in asking for confirmation in the Bible is the story of Gideon. Now if you don't know what I'm talking about, I encourage you to read the Bible more. You'd be surprised how many people don't maybe not know what I'm talking about. But Gideon, the story of Gideon, Gideon is, 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 is incredible. Now, most of us, when we think of Gideon, we only think about the fleece that Gideon laid to try to discover God's will for his life. But in the story of Gideon, he asked for confirmation from God over and over and over again. And we're going to look a little bit, a little bit at that. Judges chapter 6, verse 17 through 18. Gideon replied, and he's, he, he's talking to the angel of the Lord, which most people believe is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. I, if, I, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. Now what's happening, Gideon is in a barn threshing wheat, Okay? Now, threshing wheat is very important. Why? Because that's what my name means. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, Vance means to thresh wheat. I don't know where my parents came up with that. Actually, it's my granddad's name. But again, the angel of the Lord, while he's threshing wheat, appears to him. And most people, most scholars think that when it refers to the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, that it's actually referring, re referring to Jesus Christ before he was incarnate into human form. He asked for a sign if it's really God talking to him. Now think about this. He's there. The angel of the Lord is there. And he's asking, is that really you? Now I don't know if you've ever had anyone just appear in your workplace. But I haven't. I don't know if I'd have to ask that question. But you'll see it over and over. Is that you? And he asked, is that you? Show me a sign that it's you. <laughs> now, think about this. Even in the Old Testament, with Jesus sitting under a tree, they had to work out their doubts and their fears. God understands when you have doubts and when you have fears. You say, well, in the church we should never have doubts. Really? Then you can never learn. Of course we have doubts. I believe everything this word says. But there's things I don't completely understand. There's things I will not even teach in the scripture because I don't completely understand them. And I won't teach them until I do understand them. Why? I never ever want to teach something against the word of God. I want to teach it because I'm told to study it, to show myself approved. But it's okay to doubt. It's okay to be afraid. Is fear a sin? Yes. But it's one we all have. Is worry a sin? Yes, if it's one we all do. Why? Because we don't trust God as much as we should. But God is okay with our doubts. He will work with our doubts. He's big enough to handle our doubts. And think about this. Gideon asked the pre-incarnate Christ, Can you wait here so you can prove to me, your God, why I go cook a dinner for you? And he goes and he kills a goat, he cuts up the goat, he cooks the goat and some bread. Now think about that. That takes time. Now I know we live in a microwave culture where you think you can just throw the goat in the microwave, push a button, and out pops goat and bread. 
that you can give Jesus, but that wasn't the, t- the time during Gideon. He probably had a, you know, a knife that looked more like a spoon. And I imagine as he's killing this goat, it's screaming and hollering and wanting to run around. And he's got to cut it all up, and then he's got to cook it. And then he's like, oh, no, I have to make bread too. I don't know if you've ever made bread. That takes time. And then he does all this, and Jesus is waiting. Jesus is okay with our doubts. I mean, think about this. Jesus could have got offended. Who are you to doubt me? Who are you? I am the Son of God. I am the I am. How in the world do you expect me to wait on you while you go cook goat meat? But that's what Jesus does. How much does that show the patience and the love of the one that we serve? While he sets and waits for us to become comfortable. I think many, many times in our life, we're not waiting on God. I think God is waiting on us. He's waiting on us to hear and to act on the voice that he's given us. And even if we got to work through some doubt, even if we got to work through some fear and worry, he is willing to sit and wait on us. That is the type of God we serve. To me, that is miraculous. I don't like waiting on anything. Anything. I, I mean, I don't like going to the doctor. Why? you got to wait, especially in America. My goodness, you have to wait a long time here. I'm like, I had an appointment at 9, and you don't see me to 1130. I mean, what are you, Filipino? I mean, it's crazy. Trust me, my Filipino brothers would not be upset with that. Thankfully, I don't like to wait. I don't like to wait in traffic. I mean, in the, in the, in the UAE, we had traffic. We had a 12-lane highway that often would be bumper to bumper. We planned our whole life by what the traffic flow was doing. Because any time we had to go somewhere, you're thinking, what's the traffic right now? Okay? And if we went to the doctor and we couldn't get back by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we would stay until 10 at night. Because it would take 3 to 4 hours to get back because of all the traffic. I didn't like to wait then. But it's amazing. Now in Kincaid, Illinois, if I get behind a tractor, I get furious. <laughs> I forget the whole fact of what real traffic is like. And I think, this farmer could have done this at 4 o'clock in the morning. What's he doing out here now? But Jesus waits for Gideon to kill, cook a goat and make bread. God knew, knows he's God. And again, he could have got angry, but he understands when we have doubts and fears. And I want to say this, and, I, and maybe this is for you, maybe it's not. You're not waiting on God. God is waiting on you. Brent said, I think it was Brent that said this tonight. Sometimes you got to move. God's waiting for you just to move. You've been praying for something. You've been waiting for something. You've been asking for something, but you're standing still. Sometimes you got to take that step of faith. And as soon as you do, God will flood into that situation in a heartbeat. But you got to move. In our situation of coming here, we were praying, God, do you want us to go back to the pastor? God, do you want us to go back to America, the pastor? God, do you want us to go back to the American pastor? And we didn't hear nothing. And I thought, I want God, because I used to say this. I've said this in probably about 150 churches in North America. I said, God, if you ever want me to pastor, you will have to come down from heaven and tell me personally. And I guess that's kind of what I was waiting on. Just waiting on God. Come and tell me. And then I wrote a friend, actually uh, 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 one of my leaders, and he said, as long as you're sitting there, God ain't going to tell you nothing. He says, if you will get up and move in that direction, God will either say, stop, or peace will overflow you like a river. And as soon as we did that, as soon as we pushed sin to our resume, our hearts were full of peace, and we knew that God was in it. But Gideon asked for a sign. Does he get it? Judges chapter 6, verse 19 through 21. Gideon went outside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. 
I think he got a sign. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a rock eat goat and bread. I haven't. I wonder sometimes, did Gideon get upset? He's like, well, I made that for you, not the rock. <laughs> but, that, I mean, wow. I mean, you're talking about a miracle. Boom, a rock consumes the goat and the bread. The angel of the Lord, boom, disappears. You think that would be enough for Gideon? No. No. Gideon still wants more confirmation. Judges 6, 36 through 38, Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the, only on the fleece and on the, the ground is dry, then I will know that you save Israel by my hand as you had said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. So first of all, the rock has lunch. Then he lays out a, 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 a piece of wool cloth on the ground. The next day, that's the, the ground is dry. This is wet. He wrings out a whole bowl of water. Wow, another miracle. Try that in your yard this week. It don't work. Is that enough for Gideon? I mean, one, God made a rock have dinner. He disappears. Then he does this miracle of the fleece. Still not enough for Gideon. You, you, you think Gideon would surely know by now, this is God, God is telling me this. But no, in Judges 6, 39 through 40, Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with my fleece. But this time make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. That night God did so, only the fleece was dry, all the ground was covered with dew. Again, another miracle. A reverse thing. I don't know if it's Gideon just didn't really want to do what God was asking him to do, or he was just really stupid in the fact that, is this, still, is this God? How many other people can make a rock eat lunch? How many other people can do this with a fleece and do the opposite the next day? Only God can do these kind of things, but still... This is so amazing, and it's so amazing that God did it. That is what amazes me more than anything. It tells me that it's okay if I ask God for confirmation in my life. It's okay if I say, God, I'm afraid. God, I'm doubting. God, I'm worried. Are you sure? Please give me a sign. Please show me something more. It's okay to have doubts. It's okay to ask God to confirm what He wants for our lives. He is patient and He will work with our fears. He will work with our doubts. But let me say this, when the confirmation does come again and again, there's no other thing you can do but obey. And then Gideon prepares an army. And the God, God tells him to call together the men of Israel. And it says that there were 32,000 soldiers. They're surrounded by the Midianites. And as the story keeps going, God tells Gideon, you know what, Gideon? There's too many soldiers. Now, I've been in warfare. I've never had a leader say that thing to me in my life. You know, we got too many soldiers. Can we send some of them home? They're surrounded. 32,000. Then he says, if there's any of them that are afraid, send them home. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been in warfare. I don't care how brave you think you are, you will be afraid. But see, the reason that God wanted to do this, God knew with 32,000 people, if they won the victory, they would actually think they did it. And there's so many times in our life, so many situations, and we'll... Something happens and God blesses us or God provides or God does a miracle in our life and we want to give everyone credit except God himself. We want to say it's because of me. It's because I'm so holy. It's because I prayed so well. It's because I fasted for four days or whatever it may be instead of giving God the glory ourselves. But the story keeps going on. Not only did 22,000 people leave, God then says, that's still too many. Okay, we've got 10,000 left. We're surrounded on three sides. And he says, I want you to tell everyone to go to the river and get a drink of water. 
And the ones who lap water like a dog put them over to the side. And I'm sure I know what Gideon was thinking. He's like, yeah, let's get rid of those nut jobs. Because, I mean, have you ever tried? I actually tried this last night to lap water like a dog when I was going over my notes. Try it. It ain't easy. I mean, you can't do it. And I can just imagine, I mean, if I was Gideon and thinking, what is wrong with these guys? But they're sitting there. And, and God says, no, don't get rid of those. Get rid of the people who drink water like a normal person. And then Gideon is left with 300. From 32,000 to 300. Gideon asked God for confirmation. God gave confirmation. Then God asked Gideon to do the impossible. Let me tell you something. No matter what God is asking you to do in your life, and I'm, I'm talking about in your, in your life, the purpose and plan for your life. If it doesn't seem like it's impossible, it probably isn't God asking you to do it. God doesn't ask you to do the things you could do on your own. God is asking you to do the things that you can only do by his empowerment, his enablement, and his help. If it don't take God to do what he's asking you to do, then it's not probably him who's asking you to do it. Even if it's for you to change, even if it's for you to give up something in your life, you still need God to help you do it, and he is asking you to do that. But we know the story. But then Gideon, after seeing the whole thing with the rock, after seeing the thing with the fleece twice, then having his army go from 32,000 to 300, God is asking him now to do the impossible. He wants another confirmation. The rock wasn't enough. The fleece wasn't enough. Now that you've cut my army from 32,000 to 300, the doubts have returned. And let me say something. When you stick your foot in the fire, the doubts will come back when you feel the heat a little bit. I've shared many, many times how before we came to, to Kincaid, we, were, we continually was asking God, can you confirm it? Can you confirm it? And God would do it. And honestly, I was a lot like Gideon. I'm like, thank you for that, God, but what, I want this too. 26 things we have on a list that eventually will find its way into my office wall of the things that God asked me to do. Why 26? Because so many times, as I knew God was asking me to do this and I'd take a step, I'd feel the fire. And I also asked over and over and over for confirmation because I knew when I came here, there would be doubts, there would be fears, there would be worries that would come over me, and I'd have to go back and look and say, yes, if you did it then, you can do it again and again and again. The confirmations of God are for our peace, and He's a gracious God, and He understands that we get afraid. He understands that we have doubts, and He wants to ensure us. He wants to encourage us that we're on the right path for Him. But Gideon asked for another sign, and God tells him to disguise himself and go into the enemy camp and listen. And as he is there, he hears the enemy talk about their fears and dreams of being destroyed, and Gideon is encouraged and we know the story. He, he wins the war. It's okay for you and me to ask for confirmation. I did this when I received the call to be a missionary, as I shared with you about calling my grandfather. And I certainly did this when I came here. I was much, much more afraid of coming to Kincaid, Illinois, than going to the Middle East as a missionary. <laughs> Why? I didn't, it didn't make sense to me. I didn't know why God was asking me to do it. But I knew he was. And over and over and over again, I said, God, I'll do anything you want, but you've got you to gotta let me know. You've got to let me know that I know that I know that I know this is what you want me to do. And he did that. So I'm going to share with you three ways that we can find God giving us confirmation, that we can ask and find confirmation. Number one is in his word, in his principles, in his character. Does what... What I feel like God is asking me to do, what, I, what we feel like God wants us to do, does it line up with Scripture? Is it, does it line up with who God is? Would the Bible agree with what you believe, you, th you, th you think God is telling you? Because God's voice will never, ever contradict the Word of God. Never. It can't. Matthew 19, verse 3 through 8. 
Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. Divorce doesn't line up with the character of God. Love, kindness, forgiveness, grace, denying yourself, these are things that line up with the character of God. And if you think that God is telling you to leave your spouse for another person, that could not possibly be the word of God for you. In Alabama, in Huntsville, uh, close to where I grew up, there was a church. And a prophet came to the church. And he prophesied to the piano player that he was married to the wrong woman. And that he should immediately divorce her and marry this woman. And he did it. No, I I'm not saying that for Jeremy. <laughs> but he did it. You got to know that's not the word of God. You got to know because once you say I do, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, whatever they call that uh, life partner, whatever. I don't even know what it's called in America anymore. Soulmates. That's it. But, and he did it. You got to know that's not in line with the word of God. And they asked Moses this question because they had lifted up the words of Moses higher than the word of God. And Jesus says it should not be that way. Now, I'm not condemning people at all. I'm not even getting into that subject of divorce and the tragedy that that is. In the church, we have sinned against people who've been divorced. Does God hate divorce? Absolutely. Does he hate the people who are divorced? Absolutely not. And we have to stop treating divorce like it's blasphemy in the Holy Spirit. It would be better sometimes if I killed my wife than divorced her. Okay? Because if you killed her, you can go to prison, you get out, and you have a great testimony, and everybody will come pay to hear you preach. No, divorce is a sin, but it is a forgivable sin. And it is not like blasphemy of the Holy Spirit the way we've treated it. And we need to treat people who've been divorced with love and respect and that God can cleanse them and make them new and create a new life for them. So I'm not ever condemning people in that situation. The reason that God hates divorce is not that he hates the people. He hates divorce because he hates the pain that it causes. God does not like to see us in pain. He doesn't like to see families destroyed. He doesn't like to see the hurt that comes from it. He hates all sin because that sin has consequences of pain and suffering and heartache. And he hates it. But he never, ever, ever hates the sinner. And there is only one sin that is unforgivable. And let me just say this. Don't worry about it. If you had committed that sin, you wouldn't be here today. So let it go. But in every divorce, there's one person who has a hard heart, at least. They won't put their spouse before them, and it leads to this. But the people here, the point of the, the, me bringing that out, is the people were trying to lift the words of Moses higher than the word of God. And we see this even in, 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 in churches around the world. I mean, that's one of the things with the Catholic Church, is they have lifted the words of the popes higher than the biblical word itself. And that is the problem that started the Reformation that we marked last Sunday. And you'll go up to people and you'll say to them, what you're doing goes against the word of God. And they'll say, but my church doesn't see it that way. Or I don't see it that way. What? When does our feelings come up higher than the word of God? When does what a pastor say or a church say or a denomination say come up higher than the word of God? And a good example of this is tithing. The Bible could not be more perfectly clear about tithing. Not only how much, but where it's supposed to go and how it's supposed to be paid. 10%. But when I was in the UAE, we had our church was mostly immigrants. I mean, the country is mostly immigrants. 88% of the UAE is immigrants. And the people who would come from India or the Philippines or from Africa or whatever, they would tell us, our pastor in, the, in, in, in India told us that we should pay our tithes back there. And I'm like, well, how long have you lived here? 20 years. And I'm thinking, no wonder your pastor told that. He's getting rich off you. 
No, our, what we would tell our church members is you don't eat at McDonald's and pay Burger King. They thought it was funny. You say, but I want to give part of it to a missionary. That is not where the word of God says it goes. We have to obey the word of God. Not man, not our feelings, not our heart, not even effective giving, not even what the word of God says. God does not care how much we, our churches, the preachers on TV, the so-called prophet, or anyone else sees it because it is written. And God's word cannot be replaced by the babbling of people with hardened hearts. You say, well, I don't believe that. That's the, that's the whole point. It doesn't matter what we believe. It matters what the word of God says. And in our country, more than any other time, we got we to we gotta stop worrying about what PC culture says and what this culture and that culture says and only worry about the Word of God says. No matter what kind of persecution it brings, no matter what kind of hardship, no matter if you isolate me or call me a Nazi, I will proclaim the Word of God and I will not change it for anyone because I don't have that authority. But in our country, we're willing to say, well, Romans, that's not good anymore. Hebrews isn't very good, and, well, we don't need the Old Testament at all. I mean, it's getting down to where all they want is the Song of Solomon. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you haven't read the Bible in a while. But I'm amazed at how many people actually try to take scriptures to justify what we're doing. Christian people, we will take scripture to try to justify our sin. Let me, let me show you how I can tell. Have you ever looked in here to see if you can do it? You want to do something, or you, you ask the pastor, is it a sin to do this? If you're asking, don't do it, because it already, you're already revealing your heart. If you're trying to find in the Word of God permission to get away with it, you've already crossed the line. We don't study the Word of God to see where we can sin. We study the Word of God so it will build up in our heart where we won't want to sin. When it doesn't line up with the nature and character of God, it doesn't need to be in our life. But again, don't worry about the things that you're struggling with. You say, what do you mean don't worry about it? If you have sin in your life, and we all do, whether it's lying or gossip or lust or whatever, and you keep trying to stop, you keep trying to push that out of your life, cut it out. Seek God. Study the Word of God. Pray fast, and I promise you the desire for that will go away. If the church would get our eyes upon Scripture and our eyes upon the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the eyes off everything else, we will be overcomers. We will be more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. We will finish the course. We will fight the good fight, and we will come out victorious. We've got to focus upon the King. And so often we'll try to take one scripture to justify our behavior or our choices. You can't take one scripture. You've got to take the entire word of God. I don't know how many sermons I hear. They take one scripture and try to create a whole doctrine out of a scripture when the Bible as a whole could not possibly support that teaching. It's not about one verse. It's about the whole word, undivided, uncut, unedited, we got to stop taking Scripture out of context to justify our rebellion and our disobedience. If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, God ain't speaking that to you or to me. And when we do that, when we try to use the Word of God to justify ourselves, all we're doing is falling in the hands of the devil because that's exactly what he does. From the Garden of Eden until right now, his main weapon is to get you and I to doubt, question the Word of God. Not things that we don't understand. Corey Tim Boom said, don't worry about the things in the Bible you don't understand. Worry about the things you do understand, but you don't do them. But Satan will say, the Bible doesn't really say that. Oh, the Bible didn't mean that. That was a long time ago. This is exactly what he did in the Garden of Eden. This is what he did to Jesus. And if he's going to, if he's going to try to use the Word of God against the Word of God, he's certainly going to try to use it against you and I. He tells Jesus, he, you know, hey, Jesus, this, 
And basically Jesus just says, you don't know the word of God, you snake. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, if it's not a part of God's character, it doesn't matter how many times you quote it on Facebook, it doesn't make it true. The second thing that can be a confirmation is his wisdom. And his wisdom will often come through his people, his counsel, godly people and godly counsel. Does godly counsel agree? Now, this is a thing that sometimes that we can get kind of, you know, because we can be very prideful where we don't want to ask for advice. Now, one of the things that I've always loved about my dad, my earthly dad, my dad will not give me advice unless I ask for it. He just won't. When I joined the army, he never wanted me to join the army. He didn't want me to go in the military. He knew with my anger and my hate, it would just infuriate that and raise it up to another level, and it did. But he, I never knew he didn't want me to go into the military until I got out, and he told me that. He said, you didn't ask. He said, I wanted it to be your mistake and not my mistake. But we need to not be so prideful, and sometimes we need to ask for help. We need to ask for counsel. Proverbs 12, 15, the way of fool, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Proverbs 24 and 6, surely you need guidance to wage war, and victory is won through many advisors. The key is godly counsel, discerning godly biblical counsel, not ungodly human counsel. And you might be thinking, how can you know the difference? It's easy. If you ask five people and you get five different answers, you're not seeking godly counsel. Because if you're asking godly people, you're going to get the same answer over and over and over again because they're going to be basing it on the Word of God, not their opinion, not their experience, not their ideas or their, or their, their education. They're going to base it on the Word of God. We'll have people say, I've asked people, I'll ask them, have you sought counsel on this? Oh, yes, yes, but they all tell me different things. Then get better counsel. Or they keep going to someone. And if they go to, they go to Brother Louie, and he doesn't say what they want. They go to someone else, and they don't say what they want. They keep going until they find someone who says what they want because they're not really looking for counsel. They're looking for affirmation. Most people who've come to me over the years, that's exactly what they were looking for. They just wanted me to affirm what they already believe. Or they will shake their heads yes and do the exact opposite. According to their own culture or their own life or their own desires. Seeking godly counsel doesn't mean we've already made up our mind what to do. Also, asking for confirmation is not going to people and asking them which decision you should make. That's not counsel. That's not asking for confirmation. If you're... God's not going to call someone else to tell him what he wants you to do. He may use someone else to confirm what he wants you to do, but he's not going to call them to tell them that. If people come to me and say, what should I do? Pray. People don't like that answer. It's amazing how much people don't like that answer. What do you want me to do? Pray. Or if, you, if they come to you, I don't know what to do, and I'll say, have you prayed? And you get that look. I don't know if you ever get that look. Pastors get that look a lot. Pray. Yeah, that thing you say you're doing on Facebook all the time. Try it instead of posting it. I've also had people come, what is God's will for my life? How do I know? Ask him. It will never, ever work that way. I can't tell you what God's will for your life. Generally, I can. His will for your life is that you die to yourself, you become more like him, and be salt in life in this world. But I can't get a whole lot more specific than that. His purpose for you is to transform you into the image of your son. What he wants you to do in your community, in your family, in your area, in your workplace, you got to talk to him about that. He may use me or someone else to confirm it, but biblical counsel in, in, in confirmation is that. I've been praying, studying scripture, and seeking God about this. Will you join me in, that, in, in, in doing that? Will you pray with me? Will you seek the word of God with me? Will you seek God with me about what I feel like he's wanting me to do? That is seeking counsel. You can't ask for confirmation when you've never heard anything to start with. Or it's not confirmation. 
And it's not asking others to hear from God for you, but with you. That is what counsel is. The third thing that can help us have confirmation is his ways, his peace, his calm, the fruits of the Spirit. Do you have peace? Now, I'll say this. Peace isn't the absence of risk. Peace isn't the absence of conflict. Peace isn't the absence of obstacles and difficulty. You cannot know peace until you've known conflict. But you have to have peace. Again, coming here. I'll back up a minute. Going to the Middle East. When I decided to finally move to the Middle East, we had prayed to move to the Middle East. We'd lived in, in, in Greece. We'd lived in Croatia. We'd lived in Germany. We had prayed for years and years and years to get a visa to live in the Middle East. And I had two very young daughters. And I'm about to move them in to the heart of the Muslim world. I needed peace. But no less than when I came here. When I came here, I knew it was going to be difficult. I knew I was going to have to give up some things. I knew financially I was going to have to give up some things. You say, well, you have more now than you have then. You've got to give God credit for that because it doesn't make any sense. I make less money now than I made as a missionary. I have kids. They're going to, they're going to go to college at the same time. Kendra and Leander are in the same grade. Kendra is two years ahead, and they're going to go to college in about two or three years, and I have no idea how I'm going to pay for it. If I was a missionary, the church of God would have paid for it. There was fear. There was worry, and I'm like, God, i, I got to take care of my family. You've got to give me peace. And he did. He provided in ways, I, I can tell you privately, I'm not going to say them from up here, of Awesome and awesome things. We had no furniture at all. Not one even lawn chair in America. We had a lot of decorations, and they're really cool. If you ever want to see them, come to the parsonage. We have a China room, a Middle East room, a Greece room. But we had no furniture, none. I knew the church could not pay for our furniture. I did not want to get a loan. I'd hate debt. I was no way I was going to get a loan for furniture. I'm like, God, I have no furniture. How can I go back to America and pastor? God will do things you'll never expect. Every piece of furniture in the parsonage was paid for by my denomination, who have never given me anything in my whole life. Nothing. The only thing I ever got free from the Church of God was those faith promise cards missionaries give out. That's the only thing they'll give us for free. And I, with, they, they said, what do you need? And I'm thinking, you're serious? They said, yes, what do you need? I said, well, we need furniture. Lots of it. She says, what kind of furniture? I said, name it. Everything. And they said, we got you covered. You don't think that's God? I had a missionary friend, I hope who's not watching right now. He left the mission field five years ago to pastor. They didn't give him nothing. And that's not because so, I'm special, because I'm not. But peace. It always takes faith to follow God, but it never takes fear. You can have peace and follow God. And what is faith? Again, we, we want to make faith belief, which is part of it. It's trust. Trusting. God, if I step forward, I'm not going to fall. Every person in the Bible, it said, by faith. If you look at the, the, you know, the, the hall of faith in Hebrews, Gideon, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Moses, by faith, by trusting in God. But it doesn't mean there wasn't doubts and worries and times of fear. But that peace that surpasses all understanding came upon them. You can face high mountains. You can face many obstacles. You can face incredible difficulties and still have peace. If God is leading you, he will give you peace. Not comfort, but peace. Peace and comfort are not the same thing. I realized that very early in pastoring in Kincaid, Illinois. I have complete peace <laughs> and no comfort. And I ain't talking about physical comfort. I worry about the church all the time. 
I mean, I had to go to Missouri to stop worrying about the church. It's amazing what you can find in Missouri. Colossians 3.15, let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. There's too many of us who we let worry and fear and doubt and bills and medical reports and family situations rule our hearts. We need to let the peace of God rule in our hearts. And when we're moving in a direction that we think God wants us to move, you're going to either feel peace or you're going to feel, don't go there. As soon as I sent my resume out to pastor, I felt peace. If I would have felt, whoops, big mistake, then I would have said, ah, never mind. Philippians 4, 7 And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Understanding in this text means logic and reason. Guard means to protect from invasion, fear, worry, confusion. Why don't people tithe? Some are just afraid. They're afraid if I give 10%, I won't have enough, I won't be able to pay my bills. It's fear. It's lack of trust. Or it's the love of money, which is worse. Or it's the want to control everything in their life, which is even worse than that. There are going to be times in which we just don't feel right about situations. And we're afraid to say anything. It's okay to say, I don't have peace about that. Now let me just say this. Don't use that as an excuse. There's a lot of people in the church that will use that as an excuse. Hey, can you take out the garbage? I don't feel peace about that. I'm 50 years old. I have never felt peace about taking out the garbage. I've never felt peace about a lot of those kind of things. That's not what we're talking about. You can only truly feel the peace of God if you're actually abiding in Him, spending time with Him in prayer, reading, studying, fasting, in a right relationship with God. That is when you can, you can quantify and, and, and verify this peace is from God or it's not. Again, people like to use peace as a weapon. It's not a, peace isn't a feeling. It's more than a feeling. It transcends it. It transcends feeling. And what in Philippians Paul is saying, it transcends logic. It transcends reason. I am a person. I have three degrees in missions. 26 years of experience in missions. I studied Islam for 20 years. And I live in Kincaid, Illinois. I have not seen a lot of Muslims yet in Kincaid. I've looked. It, beyond all reason, beyond all explanation, God said go, I came. I cannot say I still fully understand it, I've just embraced it. I have complete peace that I made the right decision. I don't doubt, did I, did I do the wrong thing? Now there's times I would like to find an airport, I won't deny that. There's times I would like to go back to where I'm Dr. Vance, or actually the Reverend Dr. Bishop Vance Massengill, where everything I say, people listen to. That was, like, that was actually a good thing in the Middle East. Cause... But when I came, when we came here, there's been peace. Are there times of doubt? Yes, but then the peace overtakes that. And I can't tell you how many situations we've been in the world where the world will say no, but we had the peace of God. When, we became, when I became a missionary and I confessed it to my church, I stood in First Assembly of God in Arab, Alabama, and I said, God's calling me to be a missionary. And the people in the church laughed. That's really good for your confidence. You're standing in the pulpit and they laugh at you and you didn't tell a joke. I said, I feel like God's be." <laughs> calling me to be a missionary, and people laughed because I was a very, very picky eater. I don't like crowds of people. God sent me to China, okay? I'm a severe introvert missionary. I hated school. Mary and Carrie. I asked Carrie's father, 
can I marry your daughter? He said, no. <laughs> Having children for 11 years, Carrie and I didn't have children because I was so afraid if we had kids, what could happen to them on the mission field? And then God gave us peace. Going to the UAE, we were in Germany, in a school in Germany, and, and things were going really, really well. And, and I told them, I feel like God wants me to resign from the school and, and to move into the Middle East. And I was told, no, 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 if you stay here, you might end up in Cleveland or in a big position somewhere. And I'm like, I didn't become a missionary to be in Cleveland. I didn't become a missionary to, to do these things. But God gave me peace. Even though everyone was against it, no, you can't go, you can't do that. If you go to the Middle East, no one will ever know you if you're there. <laughs> That's actually a good time, a good place to be. Coming here, I sought godly counsel over and over and over again. People who I, I actually wrote people who I thought would say, you're crazy, you can't do that. And all of them said, Fance, I think that's the thing you should do. Anytime God speaks, his word will confirm it. Anytime God speaks, godly counsel can confirm it. Anytime God speaks, his peace will confirm it. So what is God saying to you today? What is God asking you to do? Maybe it's something he's been asking you to do for years. And you just haven't done it. Maybe God is asking you to do something new. Something a little scary. You have your doubts. You don't want to take that step. You're afraid. And you're standing still saying, God, please show me a sign. He's not going to show you a sign until you move. I learned that this year. Until I move, the sign ain't going to come. The peace ain't going to come. And you're standing there and you're so afraid and you're so worried. You don't feel peace. But you know you feel this nudge, you know you feel this drawing and this pulling, but you're just afraid to step out. I'd like for you to stand. I know this has been an odd sermon. You have an odd pastor. You have a choice. If God is asking you to do something, no matter what it is, your choices are simple to obey or to disobey. And it doesn't matter if it's small, like give this up or give that up or start doing this thing or start doing that thing. But the choice is still obey or disobey. And maybe it's something that's big. Maybe it's a career change. Maybe it's a big step in your family. Maybe it's, you know, a, a financial commitment. I don't, I don't know what it may be in your own life. But you know God is leading you in a direction. Maybe it's to be more involved in the church. Maybe it's to do something in the church. Maybe it's to do something in the community. But you're afraid. You're afraid you're going to fail. I've been afraid I was going to fail ever since I came here. On the mission field, the numbers are endless. You can win a million people to Christ and you're not even making a dent. It's almost impossible to judge success as a missionary because no matter how many you win, there's a million more who are still lost. In pastoral ministry, you can have that temptation every Sunday by the number of people who are sitting in the pews to feel like you're a failure or not. And I'm, I'll, I'll be honest, I have that temptation every Sunday. Am I really doing what I'm supposed to be doing? But I have peace. I have confirmation through godly counsel. I have confirmation through the word of God. And I'm still at times have doubts. There's still times that we're afraid. But you've got to step out. Coming up to these altars, this isn't a magical place. It's not like God can touch you here and he can't touch you there. But sometimes getting out of your pew and coming up here is a simple statement of faith. It's kind of like a childlike act of, God, I'm willing. And if God has asked you to do something that you've been reluctant to do, maybe he's been asking you to do it for years, maybe it's been something that's just recent, or maybe it's just something right now, 
Are you willing to step out and come stand up here and say, I don't know how you can do it, God. I don't know. It, it will take a miracle. There's, there's just no way. It seems completely impossible. But if you are the one leading me, I'll go. I'll come. I'll do whatever it is you're asking me to do. I'll change. I'll, be, I'll, I'll pray more. I'll fast more. Whatever it may be that God is asking you to do. But will you step out? Often that peace that we're talking about is just a simple act of obedience of God, here am I, I'll do whatever you want. So as you pray, these altars are going to be open. And if you know or you feel or you think God is asking you to do something, something you're afraid of, something you doubt you can do, then I want to encourage you to come out and stand here. If not, then we can pray and we can go home. But it's going to take an act of faith. You can stay where you are without peace, without joy, knowing that you're not doing what God wants you to do. Or you can step out in faith and say, Here I am, Lord. Do with me whatever you want. So I'm going to offer, the, offer you right now, if you want to, to come as an act of faith, an act of trust, an act of movement to come to these altars. Again, there's nothing magical. You're not going to find anything magical up here. You're just going to find something that says, here I am, God, use me. Is there anyone in a church of this size? There's got to be someone. It's just an act of faith. God has a purpose and plan for every person in this church. The question is, are we fulfilling that purpose and that plan? And with every altar call I've ever given, I could be standing here just as easily as you. There's no condemnation. There's no, you're, not, you're, not, you're not confessing the call to be a missionary or a pastor. You're just confessing that whatever God's placing on your heart, you're willing to step out and do it. Is there anyone else? It's okay to be afraid, but it's not okay to disobey. It's okay to doubt, but it's not okay to let those doubts control whether you follow God's will for your life or not. Anyone else? And then we're going to pray. I would like for you, if you would, if you want to, to come and pray with these in the altar. And just say, and whatever God's asking you to do, whether I understand it or not, whether I can help or not, whether I can assist or not, I'm going to pray with you. And I'm going to seek God for you, that he will lead you in that. That he will guide and direct you. Would you come and pray with your brothers and sisters? And don't let them stand alone. You say, Pastor, isn't that your job? That's all of our jobs. God can use you as much as he can ever use me. Would you come and pray with your brothers and sisters? I fear the darkness You always lead the way You always light the way And I will trust you with my soul You never forsaken me Oh lover of my soul I trust you completely
trust you completely Shelter and refuge In you I find protection Power that saves me You are a place of safety you are my hiding place You always keep me safe And I will trust you in my soul you never forsaken me Oh, lover of my soul I trust you completely And I will trust you you never forsaken me, oh lover of my soul, I trust you completely. In this church, I always want you to feel that if you need to pray for someone, you feel that the Holy Spirit is leading you to pray for a brother or a sister, that you have that, that freedom, that liberty to move and to act. The pastor, biblically, is a shepherd, but I'm not the only one that God wants to work through. Each person in this room, each person, God wants to use you. He has a purpose and a plan for your life. You might not fully understand it. Sometimes you have to take little steps before you can take bigger steps. But He has a plan for you. I just pray that each one of us will find it. That we will listen to His voice, listen to His guidance, allow Him to direct us, to use us for His glory. But I always want you to feel that we are a, we are a group of priests. And that if you want to pray for your brothers and sisters and God is leading you to do that, please do that. Please feel the freedom to do that. Because when I was in the Middle East, one of the hardest things for me was the fact that of the way that they saw the pastor. Yes, it was nice because no one ever disagreed with you behind, I mean, in, in, to your face. <laughs> they like talking behind your back sometimes. But because of the way they view the imam in Islam and, and, the, and the guru in, in, in Hinduism, the, the, the pastor has a very high respect and no one would ever disagree with you. But they also thought that you were the only person that God could possibly work through. It took me five years to get my church members to pray for one another. Five years. But once they did, they began to realize how God wants to use them. And I don't care what your situation is. I don't care what kind of background, what kind of sinful past you may or may not have had. God wants to use you. He wants to use you to heal, to encourage, to assure, to challenge, to uplift. And sometimes it's just to put your hand on someone's shoulder and say, I love you, and I'm here for you. 
And I want you to always feel like you can do that. I want us to be a family and to be a true family of God that God wants us to be. We'll pray the benediction. I do again want to encourage you as you're leaving, sign up for the Thanksgiving dinner. Remember to put your family name and how many people will be with you. Uh, We need to get an accurate count on that. And so please, please don't forget to do that. Even if there's a line, it won't take that long. The restaurant, they're still full of Baptist people right now, so you've got a lot of time. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but please don't forget to do that. And also, if you're not coming to help <laughs> with a peanut brittle, I, I, I hope you will. But do be praying even for that. I want that just to be a time of fellowship in which we're just hanging out together and burning our fingers or whatever happens when you make peanut brittle. I have no idea. Uh, all I know, I was told to chew gum and wear old tennis shoes know what that means but I'm going to do it so uh, but let's pray the benediction together may these words of our mouth and this meditation of our heart be pleasing in your sight Lord our rock and our redeemer and my prayer for you the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace God bless you and have a great week